I'm blessed that you are here for this Sabbath Eve service. Once again, our new website is up. It is live, as Gary mentioned, where the church is growing, growing crazy. We're getting about five, between five and ten new members every day. So it's pretty crazy now that we're available online. So if you are watching online, go to our website, prophecyministries.org, register to become a member there. You can do everything from our website. You can see all of the messages, find out when the feast days are, give your tithes and offerings. And then we also have a Facebook group and that's where all the fun is because that's a lot more live interaction. There's chats in there, there's photos. We're going to start doing a special Thursday night online Bible study specifically for the members that are not able to make it to our regular service. So every Thursday night, we're going to be in there doing a video chat. It's going to be a lot easier to keep track of. So if you're watching online, plan for that. It is coming up this Thursday. And I also want to give special thanks because a lot of these new members are also giving. So if you're interested in giving and you're watching online, we have four different ways to give. Go ahead and show them that slide real quick. If you're here in the audience, you can always grab an envelope, but if you're online, you can give online via our our website, uh, debit or credit card, or you can also send cash app. So that absolutely helps to support the ministry. And as you guys can see, it's packed in here tonight. It's about time for us to start getting a bigger building. Amen. Yeah. We're going to need to get a bigger building. So, all right, let's get into tonight's message. What does it say on the screen? How to use priests. This is one of the number one things that we find in the comments on our YouTube videos and in our uh, emails, people wanting to know how to use the precepts because this is something that people have not seen before in the so-called Christian church. When they see someone do it and do it well, it's mind blowing, isn't it? It's like mind blowing. It's like a, for me, when I first saw it, my mentor, his name was Yoaba, and he could answer any question using the precepts. And I was like, how are you doing that? Give me this power, right? Like, like Simon the sorcerer. And he's like, no, I can't give it to you. You have to study and have the Holy Spirit. So tonight we're going to cover how to use the precepts. And the punchline is you need to study and have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you have to have the Holy Spirit because people are going to ask you questions that you do not know the answer to, but who knows the answer? The spirit knows the answer and the spirit will speak through you, but you have to know the precepts. All right. We have a paleo Hebrew word for tonight. Go ahead and show them what it is. This is the word understand. Understand. It is pronounced bayan in ancient Hebrew. Bayan. This first character is a B. It's a picture of a house. The second character, remember, Hebrew is written from right to left. The second character is a Yah. That's the mighty arm and right, the hand stretched out. And the last one is a Na, and that's a picture of a snake. Go ahead and show them the meaning of these words here. So house or household, or this word means in or into. It could be a tent. It means family. But Ba, all by itself, if I said to you guys, Ba, what would I be telling you? That means to come. That means to come. So when we say ba, ha, shem, ba is come, coming. Ha is the, shem is name, coming in the name. Ba, ha, shem, Yahweh shai. Okay? Second character means to work. It's, it's a picture of strength or power. The third character is activity. It's a snake. It also means life or spiritual. It's reflective or shiny. Like if you saw a snake moving, there would be a reflection coming off of it. What do you think that the word bayan means looking at it in the ancient Hebrew? Pick one word from each column, and then you might have to add some adjectives or some past and part participles or you know what I'm saying? Some, but you need to make a sentence out of that so that you can understand, understand. Into the power of spirituality. Into the power of spirituality. That's really good. That's really good. You guys see how he did that, right? Okay, somebody else give it a shot. What you got? Oh, that's really good. It's crazy because when I'm working on this, I don't be seeing that. <laughs> I'm like, I'd be seeing something totally different. That's why I come and share it with you guys. I'm like, what do you see? And I'm writing down notes. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to share that with somebody. That was really good. Show them the letters that I selected real quick. I said into power, life, and spiritual. If I made that into a sentence, bayan, to understand, go ahead and show them. To understand means to enter into a powerful spiritual life. Isn't that what happens? Remember when you didn't understand what the Bible was talking about? 
your life wasn't spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't spiritual. You thought it was spiritual. It might have been emotional. They start playing the guitar real good, and you start crying, and snot is dripping, and you're raising your hands, and you're thinking that it's emotional. That's not spiritual. What is spiritual? Yahweh Shai said, what is, what is our, our memory verse? He said, the flesh profiteth nothing. Go ahead. What? The spirit. It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Okay, you're not going to have spirit unless you have the word. In order to understand the word, you're going to need these precepts. I remember when I was a kid, when I first started reading, uh, they teach you to read like a child. And when you start reading the Bible, guess how you're still reading it? Like a child. This book is not a children's book. It's not the yellow pages. It's not a comic book. It's a living word. And it's not to be read the same way that other books are. But when we're children, we read like children and then we become adults and we keep on reading like children. And no one ever says, hey, why are you reading it like that? That's not the way that it's supposed to be read. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. So this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to put away childish things. The scripture says, when I was a child... I speak as a child. I understood. I buy on. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, what did I do? I put away childish things. If you think that this book is designed for you to open it up and read it from cover to cover, cover to cover, cover to cover, and you don't understand it after you've read it from cover to cover, you've been deceived. Yeah, they were trying to teach you, but... A man of the most high has to be sent to teach you the word. Every example in the scriptures, you guys know that guy named Philip? Philip got transported from one place to another and he met with the Ethiopian eunuch. He was sent to the Ethiopian eunuch. What was the eunuch doing? Reading. He was reading. And what, who did Philip say to him? Do you understand what you read? You, bayan? Ata? Bayan? And he said, how can I accept some man, Right? A man needs to be involved in teaching you this thing. Okay, so let's get into it. Watch this. Give me Psalms chapter 119, verse 4. We are commanded to read the Bible this way. It says, thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. That's a commandment. It doesn't say, you have been commanded to read from cover to cover and put everything in context and make nice little notes and all that stuff. No, you need to be able to get right to the point. The, the word is sharper than any two-edged sword, ain't that right? If this book is spiritual, it's also mental and it's also physical. So when you're reading it, you have to allow it to speak to you on the spiritual, the mental, and the physical levels. It's going to make a change in your life on all of those levels. That all automatically by itself, you ought to be reading every verse three times with a different paradigm. If I read a verse, I need to read it and say, what is it saying to me in the spirit? Okay, I think I understand. I got that part. Let me read it again and see what it's saying to my mind. Do I understand what it's saying to my mind? Let me read it again. And what is it saying to me in the physical? Now I've begun to scratch the surface on understanding that one verse. And that's what a precept is in a very small form. A precept requires additional scriptures to back it up. Does that make sense? Okay. Let's go to the scripture that explains why we use the precepts. Because there's a rule regarding the precepts. Isaiah chapter 28. And let's begin in verse 9. This one starts off with the question. And then it's going to get into the answer. It says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Question mark. And whom shall he make to understand? What's the word for understand? Bayan. Doctrine. Okay. Who's he going to teach knowledge and who's he going to make understand doctrine? Here's the answer. Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you the question. Who's he going to make understand the doctrine? Who? Okay, you're not struggling with the milk anymore. Like you're not gagging on the milk. You can easily digest that. In the scriptures, what is the milk? That's the commandments. You're not struggling with the commandments. Listen, he is not going to tell you about the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and how these three are one if you're still struggling with telling lies. 
If you can't keep the Sabbath, if you're still struggling with keeping the commandments, how's he going to reveal to you the deep things? You're still on milk. Give me verse 10. And now he's going to explain how he does it to those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. The scripture says, for precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Okay, you have to go. So if you started today for the very first time, I want you to see how much dedication he requires because you'd pick up this thing and be like, yeah, I, I want to get some wisdom. And you would start reading way back here and you'd have to read all of this section of the Bible, this much of it before you would get to the instruction on how to read the rest of the Bible. You have to read beyond the halfway point to get to Isaiah chapter 28, verse 10. And from that point, you have built up Enough dedication, you know about the history, you know certain characters, you have some instruction, you've got those laws down, right? Because when we get into Isaiah, Isaiah is a prophet, and the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Yahweh Shai. So you've already got the law, now you're moving into the meat, which is understanding the doctrine. That's a lot of dedication, ain't it? You're like, I read all of this just straight through because you need that background. Only here do the, does he start to tell you, now that you got all of that, start remembering some of that stuff and connecting it with other things that you're going to find. That's how the instruction goes. It means there will always be an additional verse to add to whatever verse you were reading, and that's the law. It's not just a that's pretty cool a concept in the Bible. That's the law. Give me Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. Deuteronomy 19, 15. The scripture says, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of what? Two, Two witnesses or at the mouth of what? Three. Three witnesses shall the matter be established. How many witnesses do I need? Okay, now I want you to imagine that I come to you and I'm telling you something and you don't believe me. What would I normally do? I would go and get a witness and I bring that one witness. So I bring Mark with me and he's like, yeah, what he's telling you is true. And I'm backing it up and you still don't believe. So I'm going to go and I'm going to get Alexi and she's going to come with me also. And now we got multiple witnesses. The scripture works exactly like that. But you, in your faith, you have to say, how many witnesses is it going to require for me to believe? How many witnesses do I need to see? Do you need to bring 10 people before I'm going to believe? Or is just two enough? I'm going to need two or three witnesses. There are some people who believe that the Bible contradicts. Do you remember when you used to think that the Bible contradicted? Anybody ever thought that thing? You should repent if you ever thought that the Bible contradicted. It doesn't contradict. Men contradict with our understanding of what the scripture says, but it doesn't contradict. We may not understand it, but it is perfectly laid out. We're waiting for it to be revealed. Okay, watch this. Give me Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. I want you to see the scripture. Before we get into this understanding, because you need to know all of these things. The scripture says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. So what does that mean? When I come to the Bible and I want to understand these precepts, what's the first thing I'm going to need to have? I need to have some faith. If that guy on the stage can do it, I could do it too. The father that gave it to him can also give it to me. The scripture says, the father will freely give you the Holy Spirit if you ask him. Okay. But without faith, it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to Yah must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Okay, you guys ready? Rolled up your sleeves and everything. Give me Psalms chapter 119 verse 104. Once you learn the precepts, you have a very stiff position on everything. Stiff, right? You stand strong for the word because it says this, through thy precepts I get, what's the word? By Yon. Through thy precepts, what do I get? I get understanding. Therefore, what do I do? I hate every false way. How do I know if it's a false way? I can't find it. Oh, oh you think he rose on a Sunday? Really, you think that, huh? You show me in the scriptures because it don't say that in none of these scriptures that he rose on a Sunday. So I hate every false way. 
all I'm concerned with is what's going to lead me into a better life in the eyes of the Most High. And nobody's opinion is ever going to do that. This word is the only thing that can do that in my life. So that's all I'm concerned with. And I hate every other false way. Give me, jump down to verse 128. Psalms 119 verse 128. Now watch. He says, therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning some things, a few things, biblical things, all things to be right. What's right? The precepts are right. What's wrong? Opinions and emotions. <laughs> well, I think, well, I feel, I don't really care what you think and what you feel. What does the scripture say? Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. And I hate every false way. Do you see why I'm so rigid about the precepts now? I'm commanded to be that way. Okay. If you're taking notes, we're about to go into the section. I'm going to show you line by line, word by word, how the precepts work because it's demonstrated for us in the first chapter of Isaiah. Before we get there, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. This is the reason why we need to do this. The scripture says, study to shew thyself approved unto Yah, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, reverse engineer this verse. What am I doing? I'm rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, and if I don't rightly divide the word of truth, what should I be? I should be ashamed. Okay, but I'm not ashamed because what am I? I'm a workman and who do I work for? And how do I do that work? I study. Everybody sees all of that, right? The first thing that you need to know about the precepts is the punctuation in the Bible is just as important as the actual words. Look at that verse one more time. Show it to him. Read it with the punctuation now because the punctuation teaches you how to understand the precept. It says, study to show thyself approved unto Yah. And then there's a comma. The comma gives you a time to do what? Pause and ask the question to make sure that you understood what you just read. So let me tell you what it doesn't say. Study to show thyself approved unto people on the street so you can debate with them. They don't say that, does it? So if the only reason that you're studying in here is so that you can go out on the streets and it's not for that. It's so that you can be approved of by the father. The next line says a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. What word stands out? Workmen. Why? Because reading this Bible is going to be some what? Work. It's going to be some work. Okay. There's a comma. So I need to pause and make sure. Am I really ready to do this work? Do I just want the benefits without the relationship? No, I want the relationship because the benefits come along with it. Look at the next line. It says rightly dividing the word of truth. And then it stops. Boom. That's when you know that you got it because you have the ability to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay. let's get into it. This is, we're going into Isaiah. This is chapter one and we're going to begin at verse 15. Now I'm going to show you what it's like when you don't use precepts and you just read it straight through. We're going to read it straight through and then we're going to go back in and we're going to examine the precepts so that when you go home, you will be able to do it exactly the way that you see me do it. I'm using the punctuation. Isaiah chapter one, verse 15, the scripture says, this is how most people read it. You ready? And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yeah, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Give me the next verse. Didn't understand nothing I just said in that verse. Watch. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Give me the next verse. Reading it so fast, I don't understand none of this stuff. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Let's close the Bible and take up an offering. That's what they usually do, right? If you go to somebody else's church, that's the limit of scriptures. They're like, I'm going to give you three verses. I'm not going to break down none of them. We're going to close the Bible. And we're going to take up an offering, maybe sing Kumbaya. That's not going to work if you're trying to get into a relationship. The father is calling you into a deeper relationship. That means you need to grab a hold of his word and be like, I, I, I hold on to this word. I cleave onto it. I trust in it and I believe it. You guys ready to go back? Okay, give me verse 15. Now let's take a look at it. We're going to provide two or three witnesses. The scripture says, and when ye spread forth your hands, 
I need to pause right there and say, you guys answer me back. This is me thinking out loud. I'm reading it and I say, what am I doing when I'm spreading forth my hands? I'm worshiping. Okay, so I need to make sure because the next line he says he's going to hide my eyes. He says he's going to hide his eyes from my worship. What does that mean? I must not be worshiping in. See how that precept jumped into your mind? If he's hiding his eyes from your worship, then your worship is false because you're not worshiping in spirit and in truth. Okay, well, let's get into some verses real quick. That first line goes with this. Give me Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13. Write this down. You're going to need it. Isaiah 29, 13, it says, Wherefore Adonai saith, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Is it taught by the precepts in the Bible? No, nope. the precepts of men are opinions and feelings. So people are worshiping according to what somebody else said, not what the scripture says. That's the first verse. Let me show you another witness. Give me Matthew chapter 15, verse 7. This is our second witness for that one line. It says, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you. What book were we just reading in? We were just reading in Isaiah. So now Isaiah said that Christ said something. And here Christ is about to tell you that Isaiah prophesied when he said that thing. That's how we know it's a precept. Both of these things are the same thing. But one word is changed between these two verses. And that one word is going to tell you the definition of the word precept. Okay. Because all this time I've been using this word precept and I have not defined it for you. Let's see what the scripture says the definition is. Give me verse 8. You're going to, this is going to look familiar. It's going to be like stuttering because he's going to say the same thing. It says, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Isn't that exactly what it said in Isaiah? Okay, but watch this. Give me the next verse. It says, but in vain, they do worship me teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. What did it say in Isaiah? Precept. The precepts of men. So now you know what a precept is. What is it? A precept is a commandment, and I didn't have to make that up. Yahawashai just gave me the definition of what a commandment is because I keep his precepts. Everybody saw that, right? The verses have to match. They're going to say the same thing, say a similar thing, or expound upon an idea. Okay? Let me show you one more real quick. Well, no, let's take, take me back to the Isaiah 15 real quick. Uh, because we have so much to cover. I, I got to fly through it a little bit. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 15. We only covered one line. <laughs> he says, and when you spread forth your hands. So what am I doing when I'm spreading forth my hands? Worshiping. worshiping. Okay, but I must not be worshiping in spirit and truth. Because he says, I will hide mine eyes from you. So he don't want to see whatever it is that I'm doing, right? What's the next line say? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, this is the reason why it says yeah. Because you see that colon? He says, I will hide my eyes from you. And then there's a colon. That's a long pause. So you paused and you said, you're going to hide your eyes from me? And what did he say? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See that? It's a conversation. The Bible is alive. He said, yeah. And when you make what? Many prayers, comma. And he started thinking. He's like, I need to think about this because how often do I pray? I really just pray when I need something. But I always need something. So I guess I do make many prayers. He says, I will not hear. You're not going to listen to me? How come you're not going to listen to me? What did he say? Your hands are full of blood. Let's cover the precepts for those three lines. Give me Proverbs 28 verse 9. This is the precept for making many prayers. It says, he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Is he hearing your prayers if you don't want to hear the law? No. Absolutely not. Okay, now watch this. Give me John chapter 9, verse 31. This is my second witness. Now we know that Yah heareth not sinners. Does he hear him? No. no, I don't care how long you pray. He's not going to hear you. But if any man be a worshiper of Yah and doeth his will, him he heareth. Does that make sense? You guys see how these are the precepts for what we just read? Okay, now let me show you a perfect precept. A perfect precept is when you find another verse that encapsulates the entire idea, uses the same words, 
and puts a stamp on it. This is your third witness that comes in and says, I saw the whole thing. And he's got pictures. He got photographs like he's a real witness. Watch this. Give me second Esdras chapter one, verse 26. The scripture says, whensoever ye shall call upon me. What does it say? Well, I'm not going to hear you. Why? See that colon? That's where you ask a question. Why are you not hearing me? Yeah. And he says, for ye have defiled your hands with blood. Isn't that exactly what it said? And your feet are swift to commit manslaughter. See the precept? He's not listening if your heart is not right. Take me back to the Isaiah verse, chapter one, verse. We're at verse 16. You see how long it took us to get through one verse? We understand that verse now though, right? It says, wash you. What does it say? Wash you. And there's a comma because you need to figure out what part of you needs to be washed. I got in the shower earlier today. I smell good. <laughs> He's not talking about washing your body. You need to see what is he talking about? Wash you. There's a precept. Okay, let's get to, what is it? Mind. Okay, that's good. In the scripture, your mind and your heart are the same thing. Give me Jeremiah chapter four, verse 14. We didn't get three words into this verse before we needed to pull out a precept. The scripture says, oh, Jerusalem, wash what? Wash thine heart from wickedness that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? Okay, take me back real quick. We're going to do a whole bunch of diving back and forth because when you're reading the scriptures, what, what did it say? It's a precept upon precept, line upon line. That's what we're demonstrating now is the here a little and there a little because we had to go there and now we got to go back. It says, wash you. Okay. And now I know I need to wash my heart, but it says, make you clean. How do I make myself clean? Repent, well, repent is good through the word. You got a precept. Okay. Psalms. Give me that Psalms 119 verse nine. You don't even have to type it in. Look, it says, wherewithal shall a young man. What's the word? Cleanse his way. Clean, clean is what we were talking about. That's how we know this is a precept. It says, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. How am I going to make myself clean? Through the word. Give me, you got it? Okay. You're going to have to type that one in. Give me Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. Ephesians chapter five, you have to apply the word to your life in order for your life to be cleaned up. That's the only way it's going to happen. That's how you wash your heart. Amen. Amen. I want you to think of that word as a Brillo pad. <laughs> Brillo. It's, it hurts, right? It's going to hurt a little bit. It's, it's, it's going to hurt. <laughs> Ephesians five twenty six. Let me see what the scripture says. Scripture says that he might sanctify and cleanse. That's our precept word. It, that's the church. With the washing of water, how? By the word. Okay, I got a third witness. Give me John chapter 15, verse 3. What does the scripture say? Now, when? Now you are clean. How did you get to be clean? Through the word which I have spoken unto you. Do I need to pull some more witnesses? Like, remember, this whole thing is a court case. You're just pulling out witnesses to prove whatever the case that you're making is, you need some witnesses. Okay, so uh, take me back. We hear a little bit there, a little bit. Take me back to that Isaiah. We're only on verse 16. It says, wash you. We covered that part. Make you clean. We covered that part. See how it gets more complicated. Wash you, comma, short pause. Make you clean, semicolon. Got to pause longer because there's more precepts for that part. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Let's talk about that. How am I going to put away the evil of my doings from before his eyes? How am I going to do this? This is what I want to do, yeah. But I feel like evil is all around me. Give me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Watch the precept. What does he say to do? Abstain. Abstain. What does that mean? Stay to stay away from. Do not indulge in. To resist. Abstain from how many? All. all appearance of evil. That's how I cease to do evil. I don't be no place where they doing evil. I'm not in no conversations where they talking evil. 
you talking about evil? I have to leave, right? You guys ever seen that monkey, the hear no, see no? Yeah, you need to be like that monkey. Watch this. Give me Job chapter 28, verse 28. <laughs> Job 28, 28, the scripture says, And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of Adonai, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is Bayan. What's Bayan? Understanding. What is understanding? To depart from evil. Okay, so you don't have any understanding if you still think that evil is good and good is evil. You got to go back to the drawing board on this thing. You got it twisted. How about one more witness? One more witness. Watch this. You got some? Psalms 34. Say it out loud. She says, Psalms chapter 34, verses 13 and 14. When we come together like this, we're like, you guys, you guys know what Pokemon trading cards are? You guys, the kids know? So for the adults, our precepts are like, are like trading cards. You need to come with your and be like, oh, you got that one? I got this one. And you're trading yours with me. And I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm like, yeah, that was, that was dope right there. I'm going to use that. We come in here to feed each other. The scripture says, depart from evil and do what? Hallelujah. You got to see what's amazing because I didn't know she was going to pull that. <laughs> Depart from evil and do. Say it one more time. Good. good. Wait, wait till you see what the good is. Seek peace and pursue it. One more verse. Is there, is there, was there another one in there, Adela? 13. Let me get 13. Watch this. Let's get verse 13 out of there. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. That's a powerful precept. Okay. But it said, do good. And now I got to take me back real quick. Um, no, no. Give me, give me Romans chapter 12, verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation. What's dissimulation? It's fakeness. Let it be real love. Don't let it be fake love. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is you see how my scripture snapped to her scripture like a Lego? Because they both had the same words. Now watch. There's a, there's a period there, and I'm going to ask you a question. It's going to sound real hood. What's good? <laughs> What's good? What's good? Okay. Ma tawab. Okay. Give me 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Because there's a precept. You don't get to give your opinion on what's good. The scripture's going to tell you. The scripture says, but we know that the law is what? You see, you see how this is working? Legos, all we're doing is playing. We're just playing with Legos. We're building something. But the thing that you're building is a life. You're building your life. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Let me show you what else is good. Give me Romans chapter 7, verse 12. The scripture says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. You guys can see the precepts working, right? Okay, so if anybody was questioning, okay, I need to depart from evil and I need to do what's good. What's good? I need to do the law. I need to keep his instructions. I need to refrain my lips from speaking guile. I have to do what he said do. I have to follow his instructions. That's good. Take me back here a little, there a little. We're back in Isaiah chapter one. We're looking at our last verse, verse 17. See that first line? When the first line does not have a comma that means it's deep <laughs> the punctuation you have to see you have to analyze how well how much faith do i have in this word do i believe that the most high wrote the words do i believe that he wrote the punctuation do i believe that he assigned the numbers to it i believe all of that so when i'm reading this i am reading the punctuation as if the most high himself said you need to know that right there you need to take a longer pause learn to do well What's the first thing that pops into your mind? Let the spirit guide you. How do I do well? Well. What, what is it? How do, I do well? How do I do well? Okay. The there was, huh? The word. the word. Okay. The word is how you do. The word is always going to be the answer. I don't care what you ask. You'll be like, what's today? The word. Yeah. It's always going to work, right? Okay. But see, as I'm reading, I want you to see how the spirit works because the spirit is going to remind you of all things whatsoever Christ spoke to. He's going to bring that back to your remembrance. And when I hear the word well, my mind goes to the first time that the Bible uses the word well. It's not the place where like a deep place with the water in it. 
There's a story about somebody who was mad. The same guy killed his brother. But before he killed his brother and he was mad, and the Most High saw that he was mad, he said something to him. Give me Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. This is the reason why we jump around the Bible, because it's here a little and there a little. The scripture says, if thou doest what? Shall thou not be accepted? What do you need to do? All you got to do is well. You need to do well. That means you need to do your best. If thou doest well, shall thou not be accepted? And look at the opposite of doing well. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Wow. Sin is waiting to get you. Sin is tempting you. Sin desires. It says, and unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. So my choice is really between doing well and doing not well. Does that make sense? Okay. Take me back. Let me see that Isaiah real quick. I only got three words into that verse. It says, learn to do well. Because I know what not doing well ends up in. Seek judgment. What am I supposed to seek? I'm going to have to slap all of these together because we're running out of time. So watch. Seek judgment. And then there's a comma. Have you guys ever really thought about the punctuation in the Bible? Why it's punctuated the way that it is? It's for your benefit. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. That's a list. If I was to bullet point that thing, what's at the top of the list? Learn to do well. And then I ask a question and I say, well, how do I do that? And then he goes on and starts answering and he says, seek judgment. <laughs> well, what does that mean? What do I have to do? Relieve the oppressed. How do I do that? Judge the fatherless. Okay, I'm starting to get it. But what about, what about women? <laughs> Plead for the widow. You guys see how that works? Watch this. Let me pull some precepts. Give me Psalms 33 verse 5. Okay. It says, he loveth righteousness and judgment. There's a colon there because you need to know who's the he in that verse. Yeah, how, does it say that it's him? It doesn't say that it's him. You need to realize it says, he loveth righteousness and judgment and I don't know. Maybe it's Mickey Mouse. I just make up anything I want until I find a precept that tells me the same thing. The earth is full of the goodness of Yahweh. Okay, well, let's find out who the he is. Uh, go to Psalms 37, verse 28. The scripture says, for Yahweh loveth judgment. Now I know who the he was in the last verse. You see that? I don't get to make up or assign that attribute to anybody else because the precept tells me that he loves judgment. If he loves judgment, I should love judgment too. It says, and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. Amen. Take me back to that Isaiah real quick. When you're reading the scriptures, you're going to be doing this all the time. You got to learn them books real good because you're going to be flipping through. You're going to have paper cuts on your finger, all kinds of stuff going on, right? Isaiah says, learn to do well. What's the second line? Seek judgment. What's the third line? How do I leave, relieve the oppressed? How do I judge the fatherless and the widow? Watch, you're commanded to do those things. If you knew the commandments, you would know how to do this thing. Give me Exodus chapter 22, verse 22. Scripture says, ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. Do you see how this is the precept for where we were before? Because it's talking about the same thing. But it tells me I'm not supposed to afflict them. I'm not supposed to cause them pain. Okay, if, and if I see you in your pain, if the burden that you're carrying is too heavy for you, what I'm supposed to do? I'm supposed to help you with that burden. Give me verse 23. It says, now watch, I want you to see. It says, if thou afflict them in any wise... And they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry. Wait, if you mistreat his people and they cry to him, he's going to hear that cry. Now, you see that semicolon? This sounds like a threat. <laughs> this sounds like a threat. What do you think is going to happen on the other side of the semicolon? Oh, he's going to tell you about that threat. Okay, now watch verse 20. Give me 24. He says, and my wrath shall wax hot. And I will kill you with the sword and your wives will be widows and your children fatherless. Do you know what that precept is? What you reap is what you sow. You guys see that? 
do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the precept. Okay. I got just one, one last little piece for you guys. I got to wrap it up. I didn't even have enough time to cover a lot of it, but <sighs> give me second Esdras chapter two, verse 20. This is my second witness. I'm a call to the stand about the widow and the fatherless. The scripture says, do right. Who I'm supposed to do it right to? The widow. Judge for the fatherless. Why? Because what does he not have? He ain't had no father. So there's probably nobody training him up in the way that he should go. See how that precept snaps to this precept? Because if you fatherless, nobody's training you up in the way that you're supposed to go. So you're going to depart from it real quick. Scripture says, give to the poor. Defend the orphan. Clothe the naked. You know what that is? That's providing relief. Give me this next verse. Second Ezra 2 21. It says, heal the broken and the weak. Laugh not a lame man to scorn. Defend the maim and let the blind man come into the sight of my clearness. Does this make sense? You guys, are you getting an idea of what you're looking for in the verses and how you must read it with the punctuation and find the other words that connected together? One of the easiest ways to find the words that connected together is by using the app that I've been sharing with you guys. If the word is clean and you want to know where the precepts that talk about being clean are, you type clean into the search engine in the app and it's going to give you every verse. You're going to have to put in some work and study all of those verses because all of them are not going to be precepts just because it uses the same word. That's going to take some discernment. All right, I got one last verse for you guys real quick. Because all through the scriptures, when we're reading, we have to do exactly the way that we studied those three verses. I've been talking to you guys for about 45 minutes, and we only covered three verses worth of information plus the precepts. This is the reason why. Psalms chapter 119, verse 100. The scripture says, I, what does it say? Say it in Hebrew. Say it in Hebrew. I buy yon more than the ancients. Why? Why do I understand more than the ancients too? Because I keep thy precepts. Amen. This is the message that I have for you tonight. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.